Hare Krishna. So, I guess you can't shout this thing. <laughs> twist, but not shout. So, um, just now, I mean today, yesterday, whenever it was, they had this uh, live, live earth concert. How many people know about that, heard about the live earth concert? <laughs> uh, basically, it's a um, it's a concert, musical concert being held on every continent and Japan, uh, involving a lot of the top, I guess, popular musicians, and um, it's in support of. So, <laughs> so the purpose of this concert is to raise consciousness about the danger of global warming and to encourage people to not only take appropriate measures in their own lives, but to encourage within their communities and societies, encourage political leaders, social leaders, cultural leaders, and so on, to save Earth. <clears throat> anyway, I was in Oklahoma when I woke up this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure it was Oklahoma, and I've been traveling a lot. And I switched on the TV because I was deeply in Maya, and <laughs> they, they were broadcasting this concert it's very interesting. I, I really got, a, I think, a uh, sort of a um, important realization about how the world is changing, and so I'd like to try to explain that change in uh, within the framework of some of the classical philosophies of history, and um, then show how it relates to us in our efforts to um, spread Krishna consciousness. So, first of all, the philosophies of history. Um, if we study the history of Western civilization, which I think is relevant to the whole world because globalization, to a large extent, is westernization. The world is becoming westernized in a sense, uh, even though there are certainly other cultural streams coming into this amalgamation, which is global culture. But still, the uh, sort of the driving force behind it is Western civilization, and therefore, because the world is going that way at the present time, uh, important factors which shape the West, I think, are also significant to a general understanding of what's going on in the world. Um, so, a very important watershed event, a sort of a real turning point in world history, I would say occurred toward the end of the 17th century, the late 1600s, when uh, Sir Isaac Newton discovered and then published his little thing on physics. <laughs> the Principia. And uh, there had already been going on, it was already in Europe for, well, you had a renaissance, just, just very briefly, give you sort of a, just a very brief little overview. Uh, a few thousand years ago, there was a flourishing civilization around the Mediterranean, especially, which was classical civilization, Greco-Roman civilization, and uh, in many ways, it was similar to Vedic culture. Uh, then that civilization collapsed with the fall of the Roman Empire. That civilization basically collapsed in Europe was plunged into type of dark ages, which was the term placed on it by actually Europeans themselves when they started to come out of it. 
and sort of the coming out of those dark ages in which basically literacy practically vanished in the world, at least in the Western world. I mean, people, it was very hard to find people who could read and write. And there was nothing like science or uh, the governing worldview was an extremely fanatical religious view, which for all its piety is, what's all, for all its piety is also murderously sectarian. And I, do, I mean literally murderously. So uh, the, when Europe began to reawaken to its, in some ways, more civilized past, more liberal, more tolerant, more diverse, and more rational past, uh, the Europeans themselves, as they started to come out of, uh, started to reawaken that, they called it the, uh, the rebirth or the Renaissance, which is the French word, somehow the French word is used. So, a rebirth of a more civilized, in some ways anyway, not in every way, but in some ways a more civilized, more rational, more tolerant, open-minded, and inquisitive civilization. So that was reborn, so to speak, that's the Renaissance. And then shortly after that, I mean a century or two after that, say in the 17th century, you had the age of uh, what's called the, um, the age of reason, a sort of a scientific revolution, where people stopped looking at the world as evil and dark. Basically, people looked at the world as sort of a dark, evil place that you have to escape in order to get salvation in Jesus. And therefore, the world was not a place to investigate. It was basically a world to avoid or, or to shun. And uh, we, by the way, don't have such a negative view. In fact, uh, Prabhupada Nanda Saraswati, for example, an early uh, follower, contemporary follower of Lord Chaitanya, said Vishal Purna Sukhayate, Purna Sukhayate, that for a Vaishnava, for a real devotee in Krishna consciousness, the whole universe uh, is a cause of happiness. And Krishna, for example, says in the Bhagavad Gita that this physical world is also his energy. And he, he refers to it as divine. Krishna refers even to this world of Maya as a divine creation, not something to be despised. In fact, the whole problem is not that we love this world too much, it's exactly the opposite. The whole problem is we don't respect this world enough. Because when you really respect something, you don't put your greasy little hands all over it. It's like... <laughs> For example, if you go to a friend's house, or let's, let's say the house of a neighbor, oh, everyone turn off their cell phones, or, or anyone's cell phone goes off, you have to give it to me, and then I'll resell it. Gigi Govind Swami was saying that they have a policy when the cell phone goes off, they have to pay $250 fine. That's even better, because I probably can't sell your cell phone for that much. <laughs> so, for us, this world is also spiritual. It just has to be engaged. So, if you respect the world, if you, say you go to a neighbor's house, you respect your neighbor, and you respect your neighbor's property, you don't just start grabbing things and putting them in your pockets. <laughs> Unless, of course, they're given to you by your neighbor. So, if we truly respected the world, if we truly honored the world, we wouldn't try to exploit it. So the problem is not that... Uh, that we, are take, that, that we are taking this world seriously. The problem is we're not taking the world seriously and not remembering what it really is. So anyway, back to the Renaissance and then the scientific age. So there were figures in European history that uh, began to develop what is called now the scientific method. Mm -hmm. That if you want to understand the world, you have to actually study it systematically. So this led to all kinds of advances and we have to keep in mind that before this, the Europeans lived in a world which was basically permeated by hobgoblins and spirits and evil fiends and trolls under bridges. And it was really sort of like this uh, fairy tale world, full of superstition, full of irrational fears, and, and so on and so forth. I don't want to tell that joke, but anyway, something like certain sectors of ISKCON. With the. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just in passing, I'll mention this. We can we can talk about it later. 
There, there's really a difference between living in, in, with a spiritual conception of life and a magical conception of life. Hmm. Where, in other words, it's one thing to see the world as pervaded by Krishna, so if you just understand how to deal with Krishna, you'll be okay. As opposed to living in this magical world, there's all kinds of dangerous forces everywhere, so if you drool while you're sleeping, you are unleashing dark forces of nature that may magically do, I don't know, really nasty things to you. Or, I mean, everything, so that any type of behavior on your part, if you don't, if you don't know what you're doing, can trigger magical dark forces. And so it's, some people, some devotees actually, I think, and certainly many Hindus, live in a type of magical world as opposed to a truly spiritual conception of life where you simply see that Krishna is everywhere and if I deal with Krishna properly, it'll, it'll work out. So, anyway, toward the end of the 1600s, Sir Isaac Newton, by the way, Newton, when he was asked at the end of his life what he considered his greatest achievement to be, he said that the fact that he was a nice to Brahmachari. He didn't use those Sanskrit words, <laughs> but he was a lifelong celebrant. He thought that was actually his greatest achievement. But in any case, Newton discovered basic laws of physics and the law of gravity and so on, why the planets... So suddenly, I mean, this had... A, it's hard for us now to imagine what a dramatic, overwhelming effect this had on people's minds. Because a world which previously had been seen as magical and weird and irrational was suddenly rational and scientific. You, you could very easily, logically explain the universe. And this was seen as proof of the existence of God. Because the more intelligence is embedded in a particular creation, the more proof that it was designed by an intelligent person. For example, let's say you're walking down the road and you see a bunch of stones sort of randomly strewn about the path. There's no necessary evidence that someone came that way and moved the rocks into that particular configuration. But if you walk down the same path and see the rocks, let's say, piled up into a cottage, a little stone cottage, the very sophistication, the complexity, the intentionality behind that indicates that someone did it. Or you see the rocks, let's say, placed in a series of complex geometric designs. That also is evidence that some intelligent person was there and did that. So similarly, the discovery that the universe is actually a logical, beautiful thing confirmed what people thought anyway, that there's a God. Now, it was such a dramatic, it, it completely changed the way people in the West thought about the world. And there was this incredible enthusiasm to be rational, and to be, and that all aspects of life had to be illumined by the light of reason. So that, for example, people began to look, that's where democracy came from, by the way. People began to look at divine right monarchy. The notion that God has authorized or empowered a particular human being to serve as a monarch, a king or a queen. And people began to say that, okay, look at the king. Does the king have some intrinsic superiority? Is there some intrinsic superiority? Or is it that simply by circumstances, this person has to be king? Is there some logical reason why this person should tell us what to do? And of course, you also have to keep in mind that Newton's work, unfortunately for monarchy in the West, coincided with a sort of a, a gnarly period in European monarchy where what previously had been a more rational system of power sharing between a king and nobles uh, sort of morphed into absolute monarchy, <coughs> epitomized by people like Louis XIV in France when he was asked, like, what's, how does the state work in France? And, you know, famously said, l'état c'est moi, the state, it's me. So this type of absolute monarchy coinciding historically with the rationalizing of the European worldview led people more than ever to ask, like, is this logical? 
Is this a scientific way to govern society? Or is it just some stupid traditionalist stuff with? And that kind of reasoning led people to start thinking about democracy. So, so the development of democratic ideas in Europe was an attempt. I'm sorry I'm doing that to you, but it's, it's not intentional. Maybe I should just be a little less enthusiastic. It was an attempt to be Newtonian, so to speak, to be rational and scientific in the area of government. And it led, for example, it, it also fed very well into the Industrial Revolution, the idea that we should be very scientific about the way we produce the basic commodities that we need. And uh, now, getting back to the point, the, the main point, it also led among certain people to a very grand idea that perhaps we can be scientific and rational about all human history. Just as we look at the sky and there's so many stars and planets and there's so much going on in the world, and yet Newton showed that a few basic equations sort of explain everything. This is pre-quantum mechanics. But in a macro sense, not talking about the, you know, the atomic world or subatomic world, whatever, just talking about the general physical world, a few simple equations explain everything. So similarly, people thought, what if you could find a few simple equations that explain all of human history? And that uh, interest led to uh, certain grand philosophies of history, which attempted to do just that. And the most, perhaps the two most famous philosophers that tried to come up with, so to speak, the, the, the physics of history, Perhaps the two most famous philosophers were uh, Hegel and Marx, Karl Marx, whom you all dearly love and, and honor. So, so now I'd like to I'd like to mention what Hegel's contribution was to understanding human history and how it relates to what is going on right now, like today, in the world and how it relates to the Hooray Krishna movement. So perhaps Hegel's most famous, perhaps most important contribution is uh, his historical dialectic. And probably, by the way, used Hegel's language in that book he did called Dialectical Spiritualism, which was just a play on Marx's dialectical materialism. But never mind Marx for now who was a great historian and a really lousy prophet. But if you, if you look at Hegel, I want to explain uh, Hegel's theory of how history moves in a dialectical way. Because uh, I think to some extent he's right. And, uh, and it helps us to understand a lot of things going on today. Now, first of all, go back to Newton. One of Newton's first laws, or that's the first law I can't remember, or actually it's not that I can't remember, I've never read it, so I'm not sure, but one of Newton's principal uh, laws was that every action produces an equal and opposite reaction, which by the way is the law of karma when it's applied to human behavior. Every action produces an equal and opposite in the sense that karma is what you do and the reaction is what's done to you, so it's like an, it's like an equal and opposite reaction. So similarly, uh, Hegel said that, sort of trying to come up with the physics of human history, that in human history, let's say that society, a particular society, is going on in a particular way, like right now in America. You could just sort of freeze the camera right now in this country and say, okay, it's secular democracy, it's disgusting consumerism, it's... You know, you can just talk about all the things that are going on in this country right now. And Hegel's point is that whatever particular system you have in a society, it will produce its own contradiction. In the sense that there are certain flaws in the system. You can actually see a parody, kind of like a spoofing of this in that Monty Python movie, The Holy Grail. It's a contradiction in the system or something. But anyway, so... 
So every system kind of produces its own contradiction. And, and then when these two come to, for example, let's say a president is elected. And then he's in office for a while, people start to realize he's doing some dumb things. The opposition grows, and then out of this opposition, you get a synthesis. So you get, you get a thesis, which is just what's going on right now, and then you get an antithesis, the antithesis, which is another force which opposes it and contradicts it. And then when these two merge, you get a synthesis. They merge together to get some new reality. And that becomes the new reality of the society. It's like, for example, let's say, like in Mayapur, you get the, there's the Ganges and then the Jalangi River. So where they meet, you have like the Ganges flowing, the thesis, then you have another body of water pushing in another direction, and then they, the two rivers merge, and in a sense, you get a third reality, which is these two rivers combined. By the way, sin, in Greek, S-Y-N, uh, the sin thesis, is from Sanskrit, sum, as in sankirtan. Sum in Sanskrit means together. Sankirtan, together kirtan. <laughs> and so, anyway, Sanskrit, sum, and then Greek, sum, synthesis. I thought that would give you a little linguistic thrill. <laughs> So now, uh, moving right along here, I want to give sort of a very simple and uh, somewhat simplified, but I think not inaccurate, version of what's been going on in this country for the last several years. When there was a Soviet Union, and when China still took communism seriously, uh, the world was more or less divided into these two opposing camps. Now there was, to be fair, a third group called the Unaligned, unaligned Nations. In other words, and India actually tried to sort of project itself onto the world stage as a major player by playing a prominent role in this Unaligned Nations movement, which was supposed to be that, okay, we're not capitalists, we're not communists, we're like, we're just, you know, nice people. <laughs> But apart from that unaligned nation movement, which was sort of a historical curiosity, the world, in terms of real practical, hardball, geopolitical stuff, it was communists and the capitalists, or the free world. And so the world was divided like that. So there was a, there was a challenge to commun uh, capitalism. In other words, you have capitalism, which is not just a free market. When I say capitalism, I'm not talking about a country that has a free market. Because throughout history, there have been countries with free markets. If you look at ancient India, as we find in the Bhagavatam, there were free markets. So capitalism was not the invention of the free market. Rather, it was the relegating of religion to the private sector, the relegating of God to the private sector, and instead promoting capital, the accumulation of money, as the central public value. Hmm. So capitalism, so, so God is privatized and capital is, well, publicized in the sense of made public. And so capitalism is not to be confused with free market. Capitalism is an ideology. So that, for example, even if outsourcing jobs in America means that all kinds of Americans uh, are put into very hard times, it doesn't matter because there's a higher value being served, which is the accumulation of capital for a particular company. Or, for example, if allowing uh, all kinds of illegal immigrants to stay in the country, even though, as stated in the Federalist Papers, I mean, as the founder, the writers of the Constitution, all the founders of this country were very clear on one point, that democracy could only work among an educated electorate. Because if you have stupid, ignorant people voting, it doesn't work. Well, no comment. <laughs> I don't want to go into the whole history of American democracy, but that's, a, that's another story of how it sort of evolved and devolved into what it is today. But the point is here that when you allow all kinds of people into the country, it's not a question of whether they're, you know, gringos or Latinos or Asians. That's not the point. 
The real point is that if large numbers, huge numbers of uneducated people come into a country, uh, what effect does this have on the social system, the political system? What effect does it have in a democratic regime having very large numbers of uneducated people voting? Now, the capitalists have absolutely no interest in this because if we don't let them in, then we won't make money because we actually need cheap labor for certain things. So, in other words, the social system, the political system, the nation, everything is subordinated to the highest value, which is capital. So capitalism is not merely, it's not merely free market, not to be confused with that. It is actually an ideology in which the highest good is capital, the accumulation of capital, money. So when the Soviet regime was going on, I mean, eventually we'll get to Krishna. We are going to get to Krishna. So. You can't snort in my class. So, but I, I think devotees, I mean, I think Prabhupada actually wrote me, the first letter Prabhupada ever wrote to me was that devotees should be well-educated so they can preach to educated people. Anyway, during the Soviet regime and when communist China was really communist China, China, uh, there was a challenge to the theory of capitalism. There was another way, which of course flopped. With the collapse of that, it was just kind of like there was nothing in the world but consumerism and capitalism. There was really just nothing else going on. It was like a one, it was the only game in town. And so now what occurred to me when I saw the stuff on TV with this live earth concert and all that, is that there really is a challenge being made to sort of idiotic consumerism. And the challenge which is being made is that we need to completely redefine our, the way we think about and our relationship with the planet Earth. Now this is very interesting because in Sanskrit, in Sanskrit the word tattva, sorry, I don't know how to prevent it, it's just the perfect <laughs> in the peace. T's and the P's. Oh, the T's and the P's. All right, I'll avoid words. <laughs> <laughs> Start using synonyms. So, <laughs> I'm really like this. So, the idea is that tattva, tattva means the basic, the fundamental real things in the world. I'll explain that very quickly. I mean, our culture is very rich, and uh, tattva, oh my god, <laughs> it is the T. <laughs> Wait, th this is, I mean, what about regular microphones don't do those? <laughs> they do. Okay, okay. Ta. Or is that? Is that? I'll put it on my socks. <laughs> <laughs> the Sanskrit word tut. The Sanskrit word tut, if you add an H as English, that. That is a demonstrative pronoun. Demonstrative pronoun, it just means a word that demonstrates something, that points something out, like that. So, uh, it's like an om tatsa. Anyway, ultimately, so twa, tat twa, means the state of being that. So what does it mean, the state of being that? It means the condition of being a real thing that is demonstrable. The state of being a real, objective thing in the world. So that's what tattva means. Therefore, the word tattva is used as a fundamental category of real things, like jiva tattva, for example. We, we use the word tattva and jiva tattva because the jiva, the individual soul, is a fundamental category of real things. Or, for example, vishnu tattva, in the same way, or prakriti tattva. So, there's that famous verse in the Bhagavatam, that vedanti tat tattva vidas, those who are tattva vit, those who know tattva, they say that the absolute truth is Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. But the point I want to make is that uh, knowledge, according to Krishna, is to understand these tattvas, the jiva, Vishnu, and Prakriti. So when, when now in this country, and throughout the world, not just this country, people start to improve their understanding of the relationship between the jiva and the property. 
It is, it is a very important historical uh, development. See that? Yes. Because the earth, the earth, actually one of the words for the earth is bhu in Sanskrit, bhumi. But the earth is also often called bhu, which, which is just the Sanskrit verb to be. In fact, the b, in the English word b, the letter b, is from the Sanskrit bhu, bhavati. So, the earth is so fundamental that it's simply called the existence in Sanskrit, or bhu, or bhumi. So, uh, when people start to rethink and redefine their, the relationship of living beings to the earth, it, it's a fundamental shift in thinking. It's not just, let's say, changing the way you think about free trade agreements or changing the way you think about rap music. And fortunately, the world's starting to think much more negatively about it. The last two years, by the way, not a single rap album has been in the top ten. Anyway, sorry I'm betraying the prejudice and the maliciousness of my age group. But, <laughs> anyway, uh, rap music has significantly declined in sales over the last few years. Something which I personally am not lamenting, except for Vaishnav rap. <laughs> which is a separate, unique, transcendental category. So, <laughs> so it's not just changing the way your attitude toward this or that. It, it's a very fundamental shift in the way people are thinking about the big things, like the earth, the world, and, and living things in general. So it's practically a renaissance of philosophical thinking. Now because Karl Marx was, so to speak, a student of Hegel, and Marx used Hegel's dialectic of thesis, synthesis, and, 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 and thesis, antithesis, synthesis, to describe not as Hegel did the development of divine consciousness in the world, which is how Hegel saw history as moving dialectically toward God consciousness, whereas Marx saw the world as moving dialectically toward a communist state. In other words, he was concerned with economics and quote-unquote practical things, because he thought God was not practical. So, anyway, I don't want to talk about Marx right now, but uh, so, as long as there was a battle going on in this world between the communists and the capitalists, all kinds of college students and intellectuals were very much plugged into the Western philosophical tradition, because Marx was one of the Western philosophers. And to understand Marx, you have to understand Hegel, and Hegel was sort of coming after Kant. In other words, if you were at all intellectually engaged, in the battle between communism and capitalism, you were engaged very seriously with the Western philosophical tradition. And people were actually a little philosophical. I mean, you could actually go to college campuses and have philosophical discussions. You may think, today, like, really? <laughs> you actually go to an American college campus and have a philosophical discussion. <laughs> so, in a sense, <coughs> In a sense, nowadays, with this whole green thing, uh, I think it's maybe like, like perhaps the, I don't know what you'd call it, the resurrection of philosophy, which has been pretty much dead since the collapse of communism. There have been basically no serious, relevant philosophical topics on earth. I mean, those who are, for example, we're trying to teach Krishna conscious philosophy, but, as you may have noticed, we're not yet entirely mainstream. So, in terms of mainstream global society, for, since the class of communism, there's not been one relevant philosophical topic. What? Oh, I thought you were going to mention that relevant philosophical topic. <laughs> so, so the world is basically philosophically brain dead for years. There's like no waves. And so now with this whole environmental movement, I think it's kind of like 
an opening to engage people in just speaking philosophically because one of the very powerful things we have going for us is that we have the best philosophy. And that's not just a uh, sectarian claim, it's just, it's demonstrable. Of course, we also have this most powerful process of chanting Hare Krishna. But still, I mean, the fact that something which is sort of like philosophy is again coming onto center stage on earth, I think is, very, is a very important thing for us. And of course, in the, the first verse of the Isha Upanishad, after the invocation, Isha Vasavidam Sarvam, which is translated that this, everything belongs to Krishna. What it literally means, uh, Vas, Vasa, uh, means dwelling or residence. Like, for example, residents of Vrindavan are called bridge Vasis. The B is really a V, it's just Bengali pronunciation. So bridge Vasis, Vasi means someone who lives somewhere, you know, a resident. Because Vasa means dwelling and Vasi means a dweller, a resident. So, uh, Vasa, and then, oh my god, that's one of the phones. $1,008. Oh yeah, phones are, landlines are actually more expensive. <laughs> so, Avasa, Avasa means to, like, to dwell within a place, to make it your own. And so, Avasya, Isha Avasya, Isha Avasya Midan Sarvam. Okay, we'll all watch the child. The child has completed his walk, and now we'll go back to the lecture. So, Isha Avasya Midan Sarvam means that this world is the, how should I say, it belongs to the Lord, Isha, in the sense that it is His to dwell in. Like if you say, this is my place, it means I live there. So to claim a place as your place to live is to say that you own it. Or to claim it as your legitimate home. It's just like, you know, like, like historical struggles for homelands, and like in the Middle East. Where people are arguing over, it's my home, no, it's my home. And so, who does it belong to? So that's literally what it says, that, that Krishna dwells in this entire universe. It's actually his place, and he dwells in it. Isha Vasimidan Sarvam. So, I mean, we have so much to say about this whole environmental thing. Prabhupada talked about simple living and high thinking. The fact that studies show that people that live in nature tend to have much higher levels of God consciousness, much higher levels of belief in God, belief in, in, in the soul, and so on, because they're actually living in directly in the creation of God. If you live in a city, you live immersed in man-made or human-made things, like streets and houses and things. But when you live in nature, you're actually seeing the hand of God everywhere. And people tend to come to this conclusion. Because they're immersed immediately in God's creation. So, I know if you've ever been like in a city, and you just need to think or chant, so maybe you find a park, and you go to the park, and sort of get away from the noise a little bit, maybe sit down under a tree and take a deep breath, and you can actually think. You can actually focus on spiritual things. So, uh, and I don't think there's any question on these points because I, I, I feel that um, we should really we should really get ahead on this curve. It's it's like when the yoga thing first started. We were I asked her questions and then I ignored the hands went up. Maybe one second. I will I will call ask my calling. So I just want to say that I, I think that um, we should we should not only kind of agree with people, maybe sort of like very grudgingly renounce our styrofoam cups. Hmm. You know, because the Hare Krishna movement is one of the great ozone-busting religions. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we should really get out ahead of this curve because we are the ones that really understand it. Not, not just for, because we really understand it. This is what Krishna wants. 
This is Krishna's plan for us. So, yes. And I'm distinguishing that from philosophical issues which actually affect the course of world history. So like the whole quantum theory, string theory, whatever you want to say, is also in the same category. I would say that um, quantum theory was interesting because they were sort of like the last ones to figure out that the observer influences the observed. And uh, they finally got it. They're like, they're like, you know, sort of like at the end of the train, but they finally started to make that curve. And um, string theory, multiple universes, and so on. Uh, I mean, in a sense, how should I put it? I mean, in a sense, there has been a tension, an ongoing tension between a let's say, very hard, awesome, <laughs> materialistic view of the world, very, you know, hardcore, materialistic view of the world and a more metaphysical, spiritual view of the world, such as, like, let's say, the, the, the conflict between Christians and evolutionists, or the, or the conflict between, say, the New Age way of looking at things and sort of uh, fanatical science, materialistic science. Now, science, through quantum mechanics, has started to really soften their position and, and started to approach, you know, let's say, almost like a New Age position. Things like the, uh, what was it, the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Or the, I mean, those, those types of books, which try to show that cutting-edge science is leading to certain types of almost mystic or metaphysical implications. And so... I think that has been significant, but the debate has largely not been philosophical in the sense that, um, I mean, sort of like philosophy of science. It's, um, so it would be wrong, it would be wrong to say that there's been absolutely zero philosophy going on or there's been no thinking or no tensions or no debates. I mean, obviously that, that would be an overstatement. But in terms of something so important that it starts to affect human life. So philosophy has lived philosophy. Philosophy as, as a guide as to how we as individuals, how we should live, how society should be organized, how government should be constituted, what the goal of life is. I think that, um, how should I put it, let me, let me put it this way. From a historical point of view, uh, philosophy, which for centuries, if not millennia, was essentially concerned with metaphysics. In other words, there are physical things like tractors and oxygen and ketchup. <laughs> ketchup without onions, if you can find it. Anyway, so these are just like physical things. But what about justice? Justice is not a physical thing. There, there, there's no physical object which is a justice. Like, I'm going to have three blue justices to go. There, there's no... So it's not a physical thing. Justice, equality, mercy, beauty. Beauty is... It's a quality of a physical thing. Justice is a certain quality of behavior. And so these are metaphysical things. They're beyond the physical. Or, for example, the soul, God, and so on. These are actually metaphysical things. So philosophy used to concern itself with metaphysics. And then, as the world started to become more materialistic, there was an attack on metaphysics explicitly. Sort of atheistic philosophers decided to destroy metaphysics as, as a field of study. And to say that there was nothing but materialistic science. And in order to, and their attack, sorry for the T, that was a double T, attack. <laughs> the double T's are the worst. So, basically the battlefield they chose in order to attack and try to kill metaphysics, the, the battlefield was epistemology, which is the philosophy of knowledge. How do you know? How do you know you know? Etc. So, in other words, they said that, look, 
When we do science, we prove things, we really know things. When you talk about a soul, when you talk about God, you can't prove it in the same way we prove physical things. And therefore, you don't, you can't really claim that you know that. You can only claim you believe it. So it was an attack on the field of epistemology. Now the significance of quantum mechanics and all that was it began to, how should I put, subvert. It began to undermine the materialistic epistemology, which is that all we really know are just, you know, immediately observable things. Now, another thing which undermined that materialistic epistemology was Freud. Because Freud said that actually a lot of the reason that we do things the way we do is because of unconscious un unconscious conditioning, previous experiences, unconscious impulses that you're not even aware of. So all these things began to cast doubt on the idea that everything is just you know, observable physical things. And so, uh, so for example, the observer, when you look at something, it changes what it is, or relativity. So all these things began to show that knowing is, is a little more complicated. It's not just doing simple little experiments in laboratories. And so in that sense, it began to create new epistemological possibilities or create the idea there are different ways of knowing, which of course favored those who were pursuing metaphysical knowledge. And that, yeah, certain things can be true even if you can't prove them through empirical science. So in that sense, it kind of created a certain epistemological foundation for the pursuit of spiritual or metaphysical things rather than being a particular theory itself of life. That's all clear, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Can I repeat that? Yes. Maharaj, you're mentioning how uh, you, you feel like maybe philo people are becoming more philosophically inclined because the, the green movement is... Or at least there's something, something to talk about. Something to talk about. Mm -hmm. there, devotees or, or some persons have mentioned how maybe the hippie movement was inaugurated <clears throat> by Christian, not by Christian, but... That, that things were you know, just right for Prabhupada to come in. Yes. And philosophically, people were yearning, they were, they were searching, they were dissatisfied with the status quo, that kind of thing, Vietnam War. Are, are you saying that those kind of things are out there, that we should take advantage of those things as we see? Yes. Be yeah, be because it uh, gives us the home court advantage. Because we really have a philosophy of nature. We have a very serious, coherent philosophy of nature. We always have. So yes, I think Krishna... I mean, the very fact that there's now another way to think about the world, about the earth, except as raw material resources to be, you know, fashioned into consumer products. I mean, there's actually a different way to think about the earth. It's not just a bunch of material stuff that you can manufacture into consumer products. Yes. All right. I, um, I wanted to uh, comment on the styrofoam um, uh, that is, you know, just accumulating all over the planet. And, and there's a there's a friend in Puerto Rico who has a company called Olympio Puerto Rico. I clean Puerto Rico. And he has um, he's originally from Argentina, but he has uh, put together an impressive. Campaign, if you will, with actors like Benicio del Toro and, and um, uh, what is his name? Banderas? Antonio Banderas. Antonio Banderas and many celebrities and lab people also that are behind him on a cleaning the environment. And he's done that in many, many things as far as uh, teaching in school, recycling, and so forth. But he had one, one wonderful slogan. I've worked with him on many projects there. And it's called uh, The Power of One. Uh, el Poder de Uno. El Poder de Uno. And so, uh, so in, in my uh, restaurant, uh, it's a small little cafe, but I have a little sign up there that we recycle all um, bottles and cans and newspapers and plastic. And in Puerto Rico, there's no recycling program, really. So it's an endeavor because we have to bag it to take it to right. the facility. But um, uh, 
And on another note, I just might say that the, um, I, the only thing I'm, I've been in great anxiety because I was using these styrofoam things only to go, but I did some research online that they have, uh, which I've just ordered. It's a wonderful biodegradable alternative things made of corn that look exactly like the styrofoam uh, to go containers and all that. But they're, they're supposed to be very environmentally friendly and pretty yeah. biodegradable. So, there are actually many devotees uh, doing work like that in different parts of the world, yeah. and uh, including Vrindavan and uh, North Carolina. So, as devotees, we are focused on Krishna and spiritual advancement, but we understand that the earth belongs to Krishna, and so being kind to the earth is duh. <laughs> you know, it's, it's obviously. It's not only consistent with Krishna consciousness, it's required by Krishna consciousness, if, we, if you really understand. So I think we really need to... Because uh, we really have the philosophy. We don't, we haven't, we're not stuck with you know, these problematic verses like the Old Testament that you shall have dominion over. I mean, we... To give it one simple example, actually, is something I came across when I was doing my doctoral dissertation, that um, in South India... Uh, I was studying these different like Vaishnava groups in South India, ancient groups in South India, and so they had these texts. Now, when they wanted to build a temple, when they wanted to build a temple, they had to do what you always do whenever you build anything. You have to level the ground. You, know, you don't build something on land until you prepare the land. And so to level the ground, they didn't have tractors back then, so they used plows. Now, since they were building Deva Griha, the house of God, they couldn't just use an ordinary plow. They had to have a, a new plow, a special plow, which was used to prepare the land for God's temple. To get a plow, you had to cut a tree down. And, I mean, of course, you know, surprise, surprise, in South India, there were about a zillion rules over what's an auspicious tree, what's not an auspicious tree, <laughs> and what, you know, which way the shadow is going. Whatever. Anyway, so... Goswami takes another direct hit, but goes on giving the class. <laughs> <laughs> Unprecedented show of dedication. So, now what's interesting is that there was, there was a very clear understanding back then, in ancient times, that a single tree is an entire ecosystem. Because animals take shelter under the shade of the tree, there's all kinds of insects and birds and I mean, all kinds of squirrels. There's a, it, it's a whole echo family. Just every tree. Every tree is a whole system in itself. And therefore, before cutting the tree down, they had to, first of all, acknowledge the violence they were committing. They had to beg the forgiveness of all the living entities affected by that act. They had to pray for the spiritual well-being of those souls. And, and there's a whole process. They had that kind of consciousness-raising activity. And so obviously, if, you, if the act of cutting a tree down is completely in, encased in all of these conscious acknowledgments and, and declarations, you can't just go and, and uh, what do they call it? Um, clear-cut. Clear yeah, you can't just go clear-cut a forest in order to produce, I don't know, like, you know, junk mail or something. <laughs> so, and you find the same thing, it's not only in India. For example, if you study some of the indigenous peoples in the, uh, in the northern part of South America, the Caribbean area, which I had to study at UCLA, an anthropology class, same thing. If they went into the forest to cut a tree to build a canoe, you had to acknowledge that there's a goddess in the forest, and you had to negotiate it. And you, you can't just go and have, you know, tree farming on an industrial level. So there was a higher understanding, there was a higher consciousness about these things. Uh, yes? I wanted to ask you just to kind of go back to the point before. Um, this whole idea of theism and atheism. Yes. Nowadays there is a, there is a very distinct movement that teaches atheism as a religion. I think it's more of a fad 
then, then a serious social movement. There was some book that came out by this guy who's actually a very poor philosopher, I think Dawkins or something. Dawkins. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you actually train professionally in philosophy and read his book, it's actually very poor. And I think it's more of a fad and a curiosity. It's, I know when I was in the UK uh, doing a lecture tour earlier this year, I know I, was, I learned that many university students there don't take the book that seriously because they realize that the author is just so out of control and you know, just so like, irrationally passionate about a subject. But he had a whole section in time about The what? He had a whole section in time. He's been under yeah, but, but you know, that's the... the uh, as far as Time Magazine, it's really a case of the... the I don't know, the tail of wagging the dog in the sense that, I mean, like, Time Magazine is not really, like, shaping public opinion. It's just trying to, to respond to us and then sell their magazine. If, if you go to American universities, you're not going to see some growing atheist club attracting all kinds of people. In fact, you're going to find religious clubs and yoga clubs and Buddhist clubs having many, many, many more members. So despite, you know, the media, sometimes the liberal media can kind of adopt little things like that and try to sort of blow them out of proportion and books can become fads because they're so out of, outrageous. You know, sometimes very outrageous things become interesting. But um, as far as a major movement, I don't think so. Yes? Margaret, you're mentioning the science is approaching more of the kind of like Zen kind of um, spirituality mixed with science. Well, not just Zen. Zen is just one example. Well, uh, just as an example, as we're giving. But wouldn't, wouldn't that ultimately go back to what uh, Timothy Leary was doing back and with the whole uh, LSD and uh, experimentation? And no, I don't think it's exactly the same thing. Religious, like people who are completely unreligious, that they're believing God would become religious. Or well, I think I think science is just like they're, you know, Prabhupada said that uh, basically all roads lead to Krishna. So if you seriously study any aspect of reality, you'll eventually come to Krishna. Because Krishna really is the center and the source of everything. I mean, Timothy Leary is a little uh, weird. I mean, isn't there, it's, you know, it's like, a, it's like that counterculture is still kind of growing out of Like, there's still people who believe. I don't think that the counterculture, as a counterculture, is really like a vibrant, important part of what's going on nowadays. And so, like, I think that this environmental thing is really on center stage. Not a bunch of people with, you know, I don't know. 79 body piercings each and dreadlocks or something. I think it's really about this environmental movement. Yes? If you look at the playing field as it is now and you're saying, well, we should go greener, you know, give up styrofoam, well, we can't, if you take that to logical conclusion, we, we shouldn't use oil, we shouldn't use any plastic products, we shouldn't use car. How do we... It's not a question, it's not a question of let's say, being absolute purists. We won't touch plastic. It's a question of, in fact, that's kind of like not even where the world's going now. There was a time in the early days of the environmental movement where there was sort of like these evangelical, born again, totally radical, don't touch plastic people. But um, nowadays, what people are talking about is sustainability. In other words, uh, even if you can't absolutely give up all these products, is there a way, is there an appropriate level of usage so that if everyone used about the amount you're using, the world would survive? So it's really just making the world a better place, going along with uh, what's, what's basically a fad, but a fad... Not a fad, no, no, I think... I think the environmental movement is much more serious than the Fed. I think it's actually, what we're really seeing historically is that consumerism and sort of out of control capitalism is really, is kind of running out of gas. 
in the sense that you can't go on that way. Something has to give. Either you change your lifestyle, you change the whole way you think about life on Earth, or you destroy yourself. You think it, it, it can be... So I, I don't think that's a fad. I think that's a sort of a uh, realization the planet's coming to, that they have to significantly change the way they think about life and the way they live. Could it ever get to the point that we could actually advocate going back to horses and carriages and farm? Really, yeah. Ashram Dharma. It, yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Prabhupada was certainly in favor of it. I mean, my God, horses eat grass. You don't have to go to Saudi Arabia to get grass. And they reproduce. You don't need factories because every, every horse and cow is itself a factory. <laughs> that produces more. Uh, so it's a, oh, back. Or, or you have. You, everybody at the same time. Yes. I thought you watched the documentary The Inconvenient Truth. I actually haven't seen it yet. I've heard a lot about it, but I just haven't watched it yet. Al go wrong. Actually, if he was really smart, he would run for president and pick someone for vice president named Unga. <laughs> then it'll be Gorong. Yes? So if I get ready for the right now, I'm starting the Yeah, sure. Yes? There was a. Oh, what? Him, then you. I heard recently in Hollywood they're trying to make carbon neutral films. Yeah. They're planting trees to mm -hmm. minimize their carbon footprint. Exactly. Yeah. What are these? Trying to make carbon neutral films by planting trees and so on. Yes? My question is not a philosophical question or anything, it's a very basic question. About the food. Yes. <laughs> Why there is so much of restrictions in onion, garlic, and some sort of things like lentil and all those? Yes. Why it is it like that? Because onion. Garlic, yes. all, I think it is Actually, all over Asia, even among Buddhists, onion and garlic are yes, chewed rather than chewed. Among the spiritual practitioners, it's um. I just talked to someone yesterday. I can't remember what it was that had read something scientific thing that actually, or somewhere comes information that onion and garlic kind of uh, discombobulate something about the two hemispheres of the brain. Not this. I mean, not some. Thing of ripping your head apart, <laughs> but it but it does have an effect on on consciousness. Somehow, other people in many many spiritual traditions throughout Asia came to this conclusion about onion and garlic. The prohibition against garlic was probably a real social service. <laughs> There's a restaurant actually near where I live in LA called the Stinking Rose, and it's uh, every preparation has garlic in it. <laughs> As far as, as far as lentils, I think devotees kind of, uh, I mean, onion is not like meat, it's not like you eat onion that you just, you know, you just killed your mother or something. And in fact, I probably sometimes ate it because he couldn't avoid it, like he was at some live member's house. And there's a famous story, probably was at a live member's house, and he's eating his sabji vegetable preparation, and one of his disciples said, Prabhupada's got onion in it, and Prabhupada was afraid the guest, his host would be offended. So he actually began to eat more of it, just so the host couldn't be offended. He began to praise that subject. So, it's not that it's sinful, but in terms of spiritual practice, it's just something which we avoid as not conducive to the refinement of consciousness. But at the same time, you see the Ayurvedic. Yes. All there are so many Ayurvedic medicines comes from uh, there is an application of garlic a lot. Well, that's medicine. That's medicine. Medicine is medicine. Garlic. What? Garlic. There are so many other Well, it, but medicine, I think medicine is a separate category. Oh, okay. okay. But garlic. If, if you need something for your health, that's all. There's a lot of good applications. I'm not. Um, I don't say question. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of on the. I, I think that um, I'm sort of on the whatever platform regarding this, in the sense that uh, there are long traditions, not only in India, actually throughout India and other parts of Asia, saying 
the people have experienced that these particular foods are, as part of your regular diet, are not favorable for the development of higher consciousness. So I've never really seriously tested that idea empirically, but I just sort of go along with it because, and like, why sweat the small stuff? Why would the according to the food, food value, lentil has the most protein in it, and protein helps to develop? Yeah, yeah, I, I know protein's a good thing. <laughs> I think what we have to keep in mind is that foods have two aspects. One is the nutritional value, like you read in the label, and the other aspect is the quality, like modes of nature. So our goal is not simply to get protein and you know all the nutrients we need. The goal is also to come to Satogun. So I think the consideration was on that basis. Again, I've never really tested these things myself. I don't have so much personal experience of these things, although I suspect they're right based on sort of anecdotal experiences I've had. And since I'm a leader in spiritual movement, I'm already in enough trouble as it is. I try to, try to avoid it. I experiment empirically with it, and it's terrible. It does affect your consciousness. It affects consciousness? Yes. It affects your spiritual consciousness. Okay. <laughs> what is the thing about lentils? I missed that. Are you saying lentils? Prabhupada once said to me... Red lentils. Huh? Specifically it's talking about tasty. Tasty. Oh, right. red lentils. Prabhupada once said to me that we don't offer soy and lentils to the deities, which I guess Krishna's not going to get a tofu burger, but, <laughs> but whatever, I mean, it's just, um, for some things you offer the deities and some things you don't offer the deities, but that's why pictures are there. You fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You'll, you'll find the tofu recipes and lentil recipes and Krishna Kormas cookbooks. But yeah, I don't think we're fanatical about it, but there are certain standards for deity worship and... I, I mean, I... Hare Krishna. I mean, I understand you're wondering, but I've wondered about it myself. And as Dharma has had experience. I do tend to think that it's not a great thing. Especially any Indian garlic. I, like I said, my experiences are not dramatic, but they tend to confirm it in terms of consciousness. Now, if you're, seri if you're a serious practitioner, if you're a serious spiritual practitioner, and you're normally in a serious state of spiritual consciousness, you'll be sensitive to these things. If someone's not a serious spiritual practitioner, they may not notice it. They may not notice it. It's like, it's like if you, let's say, if you live in a city where there's all kinds of background noise, and someone is doing something down the road, you may not notice it. But if you're out in the country, if you're living out in the country where it's really quiet, I mean, you can hear a truck a mile away, and it really is like this incredible disturbance, whereas in the city you wouldn't notice it. So again, we are talking about the effect on serious spiritual practitioners who are actually normally in a certain elevated state of consciousness. It's the effect on them that is really the issue. Yes. Maharaj, you were talking about the environmental movement and the changes that's going to have philosophically around the world. I think alongside that epidemic that people are seeing about the harm that's being done to the environment, the other one we hear about is the AIDS epidemic. AIDS, right. Now, with these two epidemics, as there, or these two problems that the world is trying to address, yes. how does, as devotees, what do you think, how, how does our preaching strategy change, if at all? Well, as far as AIDS, first of all, AIDS doesn't affect most people. And therefore, since people tend to be concerned with their own self-interest, many more people are involved with the environmental thing than with AIDS. <coughs> because AIDS doesn't directly affect most people. As far as AIDS, to a large extent, it's a lifestyle disease. And lifestyle means not only homosexuality, but also things like hygiene mm -hmm. and you know, other factors, promiscuity, uh, the use of drugs, uh, uh, injecting drugs and things like that. So, you know, through various means, it's to a large extent lifestyle associated. And uh, people have to, uh, people have adjusted their lifestyles, actually. Many people have adjusted their lifestyles. So, well, what I'm saying is, from a preaching standpoint... From a preaching standpoint, our basic principle is that 
we are part and parcel of Krishna and the material universe is Krishna's energy. And therefore we don't actually have a separate philosophy for heterosexuals and homosexuals. Our philosophy is that in general we should use this body in Krishna's service. And it's, we have a universal principle which is for homosexuals, heterosexuals, eunuchs, everything. We don't have like special rules. But, so what we do is we apply these general principles fairly to everything. So, that's the last question perhaps. Have you done some uh, some preaching? I don't think it's all whatever is that is that related to the global uh, the uh, uh, environment? Uh, I haven't been so active in that area other than the fact that I touch upon it sometimes in the course of my lecturing. I do touch upon it, but I mean, that only has been a central focus in my Which shows that I'm a hypocrite, I suppose. <laughs> Since I recommend you all do it, but that's okay. <laughs> what, is, what are religious leaders for if not to <laughs> have the privilege of hypocrisy? So, <laughs> but, um, yeah, but I think all of us should, uh, I think all of us should try to take advantage of this real opening on the planet, there's a real chance to actually engage people in serious decisions. Well, in our effort to try and preach to whoever we meet, it's good to have some kind of subject to start off with on certain levels. Well, there's something that more and more people on the earth really care about very deeply, and we have the answer, in a sense. Or, or at least we have, I think, the, the most attractive and comprehensive philosophical framework within which to understand the problem and the solution. Marge, I received a package the other day and one of, uh, from a, an environmental group. They just sent me a package to go on the mailing list somehow. But one of the um, counselors in the package said, uh, think you can be a mediating environmentalist? Think again. Yay. That's a very important point you brought up, Your Grace. That, um, that actually, um, ultimately, we have to stop the cow killing. I mean, I mean, raising cattle for slaughter is probably the biggest threat to the water supply. It's, it's an environmental disaster. So, yeah, I think it's very favorable. All these things are very favorable. So, perhaps we'll stop here for now and uh, it's Prasadam time. Prabhupada Ki Jai.